Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is a show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a very screwed up psychological lens. It is September 1st, 2024, but let's go back in time. Let's go back to 2020. Do you remember 2020? I know you do. I do. I remember the first winter of the alleged pandemic. Um... You know what? I don't know a single person who died of COVID. And I know a lot of people who say, I don't know a single person who died of COVID. I've seen and observed many people claim to have known many people who died of COVID. I don't believe them. If this disease were as bad as we were told, a person like me, I have a pretty wide network of contacts, I would have known at least one person who died from something that we called a pandemic. I'm sure some of you have. No, I'm not saying that no one died from this. I'm not saying that. So there's no need to, there's no need to scream at me in the comments about that, about something I'm not saying. But I am saying, I don't believe that more than maybe one or two percent of the claimed COVID deaths were actually primarily from this allegedly novel virus. I think we all know this now. People died because they had secondary conditions or what we call comorbidities. They were very old. They were in hospital with a lot of circulating germs. But, of course, back in 2020, we didn't know any of this. Well, some people did know. They did know. We on the street didn't. And I remember walking down downtown Burlington in January. So I guess this would be early 2021. No, it doesn't matter. It was winter. Um, Walking along outside, looking at the shop windows as I went by, and I saw this um, old man, probably about 80 years old, walking in my direction. And he kept staring at me and staring at me. And right as he walked by, because he was a pussy, of course, he couldn't do this to my face like a real man. Um, As soon as he was behind my back, he shouted, where's your mask? So I turned around because I'm not a pussy. And I yelled at him, where are your manners, sir? I couldn't believe, I could not believe that anyone had the audacity to say what he said to me on the street. Uh, But of course, that was just the beginning. Um, Then when I was going to go home for Christmas, um, someone in my family, okay, it was my sister and I know she watches anyway, whatever. I'm not having a go at you, babe. Uh, wanted me to at least have a COVID test before I came. Now, we, we all feel differently about this now. It's, we've had long enough. But I said, okay. I was not going to get a vaccine, but I, I, I said, okay, to, to make my sister and my family feel better, I'll go take a test. So I went, went down to the urgent care and waited and had uh, a nurse come in. in, in <laughs> it's like, what are, what are those? Do you remember? The, was there a movie called Pandemic or was it called Contagion? or infection or something like that. You know, these thrillers where a a thing escapes the lab, you know, and does all of the really horrible things that they told us were going to happen in real life that didn't happen. So this this nurse is decked out in personal protective equipment, you know, from head to toe, like she was going to get out of the Mars space rover and, you know, rooting around in my nose. (laughs) Wait a few minutes. Doctor comes in, you know, in her white coat. Tells me I don't have it, Um, but she's not done with me. Uh, She wants to make sure that I will be obeying uh, the Vermont governor's quarantine order that says that if I travel out of state over Christmas that I have to quarantine for two weeks. I'm not allowed to leave my house when I come back. Um, I couldn't believe that any adult believed that she had the right to tell me these things and expect me to answer a yes ma'am to her. And that is what she expected. She believed that she had in loco parentis authority over me and that she got to ask me and I had to give her an answer. And I wouldn't. I said, I'll make my own decision. 
Excuse me? You heard me. I will make my own decision. Ooh, ooh, is that provocative to her. That's when the yelling started. Actual raised voice yelling. We have been working our butts off to keep people safe, and I, ah, 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 yeah, she's doing all this. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I can't believe what I'm hearing. You are actually sitting here telling me you're not, you know it's the law, and I said, I will make my own decision. I can't, you, ah, okay, 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 okay. She's having, you know, she's upset. And of course, I tried to, I tried to reason with her. Um, I'll never make that mistake again. Um, I should have just gotten up and walked out, but I, I tried to redeem myself and I tried to say things like I'm not anti-science and blah, 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 blah. And about 15 seconds into it, uh, I actually got the, the hand, you know, putting the hand out. Okay, it's time to leave my office. It's time to leave my office. I hope that bitch had a really shitty Christmas. Well, are you ready to go back? Because a lot of people would like you to go back. <laughs> you know why? Because authoritarians absolutely loved the alleged pandemic. It was a wet dream for them. They woke up sticky and in love. They, oh, they loved it. They rolled around in it like rooting pigs. They never expected that they'd have this much social and legal authority over other people. This was an unexpected Christmas gift. Um, and we found out that a lot more people are authoritarians than we believed prior to this testing event. And that's what this was. This was a test and a character reveal. Neurotics loved it too. Hypochondriacs loved it uh, because they love feeling that they are in danger. This is a positive emotion for them. It's egocentric, if you will. I'm not kidding. I mean it. They actually like this. They like to feel protected by the government, and also because it gives them license to be sadistic to normal people who won't go along with it. They loved it. So, of course, some people want it back. Well, um, so, some people includes this opinion writer at The Hill. Headline, summer COVID surge shows we may have to return to 2020 pandemic measures by Aaron Solomon. I'll read it to you a bit from the story. As summer 2024 draws to a close, the U.S. finds itself once again grappling with a surge in COVID-19 infections. This wave has taken many people by surprise, particularly as the country has largely consigned the pandemic to the past. While public life has pretty much returned to pre-pandemic norms, <laughs> please, something almost none of us would have believed in the summer of 2020. Yes, we would have Aaron Solomon. It, um, keep your psychosis to yourself. The virus itself has not. Mutations of the virus continue to occur and new variants are emerging, posing ongoing challenges to public health and safety. As we look ahead to the remainder of 2024, we need to take stock of where we are, understand the factors driving this resurgence, and better anticipate how the pandemic might evolve. Um, a little more. Quote, the recent surge in COVID-19 cases has disrupted summer travel plans, overwhelmed healthcare facilities in certain areas, and left many Americans dealing with the familiar symptoms of fever, cough, and fatigue. The summer months, typically associated with lower respiratory virus activity, have instead seen an uptick in COVID infections. Several factors have contributed to the unexpected surge. No. First of all, it has not disrupted summer travel plans. That, Aaron, is your fantasy. That is what you wish to happen. That is not what has happened. You don't know this. You just simply want it to be true because you're one of the people I was talking about a few minutes ago. You're one of the sadistic authority. I don't know if you're the authoritarian or the neurotic or both, but you are the people I'm talking about. And no, I don't believe you about these, these claimed COVID surges. And you shouldn't believe you either, and I suspect you don't actually believe you. Um, the PCR test, polymerase chain reaction, the COVID tests, they don't diagnose infection because that technology cannot, by definition, diagnose infection. It cannot even reliably detect actual exposure because of the process that they put these through. They've fudged the process because they want higher numbers. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to take me on faith. You can look this up for yourself. I'd suggest using a search engine other than Google. Why are we doing this over a fucking head cold? That's right. I said a head cold because that's what it is now. Quote, 
One factor is the high transmissibility of newer variants. The virus continued to mutate with certain variants displaying enhanced ability to spread, even among populations with high vaccination rates. Stop right there. Even among populations with high vaccination rates. Ah, so were you lying then when you claimed that the vaccines, because I'm sure Aaron Solomon said this, uh, prevented transmission? Oh, they never said that, did they? Yes, they did. Back to the quote, while vaccines remain effective at preventing severe disease and death, no, they don't, breakthrough infections are becoming more common, especially as immunity from earlier vaccinations wanes. Nope, no, that's not how this works. As viruses evolve, and they do all the time, they become easier to spread, but less deadly. That's what happens when viruses evolve. They become more communicable, so more people get them, and it's easier to give it to somebody. But they hurt you less once you do get it. That's how it works. I mean, I have already said that, you know, even among populations with, with high vaccination rates. Yeah, whatever. This here that I'm about to read to you, this is what he really wants. Quote, second, the widespread relaxation of public health measures has created an environment conducive to transmission. Mask mandates, social distancing guidelines and restrictions on large gathering have all but disappeared. This return to normalcy, while massively psychologically and economically beneficial, has provided the virus with ample opportunities to spread. <laughs> and Aaron Solomon doesn't like what that means either. Quote, Finally, the pervasive sense of pandemic fatigue has led to a serious decline in vigilance. Many people weary of the pandemic's disruptions to their lives have become markedly less cautious. This complacency, coupled with the underestimation of the virus's ability to adapt, has allowed COVID-19 to regain a foothold. Show it to me. Show it to me. Where is it? I don't see it out on the street. Don't tell me, no, I, don't tell me that healthcare facilities are overrun. I don't believe you. Show them to me. On video, time stamped, with sound. I want numbers, I want charts. It isn't true. You're lying. Quote, Moreover, the federal government's decision to end the public health emergency earlier this year has had unintended consequences. The end of the emergency declaration led to a reduction in federal funding for testing, contact tracing, and vaccination efforts, just as these tools are once again needed. The lack of a coordinated national strategy has hampered efforts to control the surge and has left health care providers scrambling to manage increased caseloads with fewer resources. Good. Good. I want the medical establishment frustrated and ineffective. I want all of their power taken away from them. The more they have to run around like chickens with their heads cut off, the better. I want their infrastructure unstable and unreliable because they should not have any power. Anything that disrupts and frustrates their aims is a benefit to us. Many of us noted that this wasn't going to be restricted to simply the COVID-19 virus. It, our approach to this, our ahistoric, never-before-contemplated response to the pandemic, has fundamentally changed the entire way that we ordinary people look at sickness, and it did it overnight. It's crept into everything, and it will not stop. It's not going to be restricted to one thing. You've seen it with so-called monkeypox or mm, pox. There is no condition or disease that will not be gobbled up by these totalitarian freaks. Like in Massachusetts. Here we go. Headline. In town at risk for deadly mosquito virus, parents challenge restrictions. I'll read to you a bit. The town of Oxford. This is from the Washington Post, by the way, and I'm um, credit where it's due. Uh, the entire tone of this article is actually... For, it, it, uh, well, first of all, they're telling the truth and they're not sucking up to the COVID authoritarians. The tone seems to indicate that the writer is on the side of the, the townspeople who are saying no to this. I'm shocked at this, but I'm glad to see it. The town of Oxford, Massachusetts is freaking out over uh, eastern equine encephalitis. So here, here's from the post. When Phil Davis learned earlier this month that a person in his hometown had contracted eastern equine encephalitis, or Triple E, it wasn't long before he decided to act. 
Davis knew about the rare but deadly mosquito-borne illness from a prior outbreak in the state that started in 2019. The town was placed on alert, and Davis, the president of Oxford Little League, remembered canceling weekday practices and rescheduling games. This time, though, Davis was fed up. He was done with being told what to do without being heard, done with taking anything else away from children who lived through the forced closures of the coronavirus pandemic. Quote, I don't believe anybody came out of COVID saying that it was the best thing for their kids to lock them in the house, said Davis, 50. We all felt like living scared isn't the right way to live. Ah, now this can be heard. Now normal people can be quoted in the Washington Post. Uh, more from the story. Hundreds of parents have since signed a petition urging town officials not to restrict playing times for youth sports, including baseball, football, cheerleading, and soccer. So many attended a recent meeting of the local health board that the deputy fire chief began turning people away. In Oxford, one of four towns in central Mass deemed at critical risk for AAA, residents are responding with a mixture of defiance, caution, and fatalism, all informed by their own experience during the pandemic. Parents are saying they are the right people to assess the risks to their own children, while town officials are emphasizing the importance of pre prevention, particularly for disease with no treatments. Well, really, are parents saying that? Are they even allowed to say that? Are they allowed to say that they're in charge of their children? Is that authorized? Are they allowed to even think that? Parents, you have to take the authority. You have to assert your authority. You, no asking, no, no bargaining. You're not having, you're not, you're not requesting. OK, if you request, you're done. All right. We have nothing to talk about. Go listen to somebody else because you uh, you'll get nothing out of what I have to say. There's no asking. There is only assertion and defiance force. Refuse all cooperation, all of it. Do it loudly. Do it in public and do it aggressively. No, I don't mean assertively. I mean aggressively. Yes, I'm saying make other people really uncomfortable. Humiliate and frighten public health officials that their jobs will be on the line if they don't sit down and shut their goddamn mouths. No, I'm not telling people to go physically brutalize anyone, so don't anyone go off on that. But yes, humiliate them. Make them fear you. Make them fear that they will look stupid and that they will be voted out of office or they will be fired. If you don't make them fear you, you won't get your authority back. Now, all of this freakout is over a disease that has been known to exist in Massachusetts since at least 1938. Want to know how dangerous it is? Eastern equine encephalitis. Quote, according to the CDC, an average of 11 cases are diagnosed nationwide each year and about a third of patients die. I'm cutting in here. So what's a third of 11? That's about three or four people. About three or four people die every year of eastern equine encephalitis, not in Massachusetts, not in Oxford, Massachusetts, but across the United States with its population of 330 goddamn million people. That's how dangerous it is. Let me finish the quote. So far in 2024, Massachusetts has reported two cases, while Vermont, New Jersey, and Wisconsin have each reported a single case. New Hampshire announced this week that an adult identified by media reports as a 41-year-old man has died after contracting the illness. I don't even believe that. Quote, for towns at the highest level of risk for Tripoli, e, the state strongly recommends restricting public group activities between dusk and dawn. The town of Plymouth announced last week that public parks would close at dusk and athletic leagues would be prohibited from continuing activities beyond that time. Yes, it is that Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yes, the second landing place of the Mayflower. Ah, second. Do you know that they, they landed on, on the tip of Provincetown? They landed on what is now Cape Cod first and spent the winter there before they went over the bay to Plymouth. Yes, this is the town with Plymouth Rock in it. <laughs> I don't know whether our Puritan ancestors would be proud or ashamed of us. <laughs> Can't figure it out. <laughs> okay, we're coming up to the end here, but it is time to talk about the wonderful people who help make Disaffected possible. And that is Anton's Meat and Eat whose family makes absolutely delicious biltong. And what is biltong? It is vinegar, 
and spice cured high quality meat. If you like a beef jerky, this is the gourmet version. This is better than any beef jerky in any Slim Jim you've ever gotten at the convenience store. It's delicious, it's low in, actually it's probably got zero carbohydrates, good quality animal protein, good quality animal fat, uh, wonderful stuff. Um, and if you want to try it out, take a look also. Um, their website is landofbiltong.com. Um, and there's more than just the cured meat there. Uh, Anton also imports European groceries. So if you've been looking for something uh, from back in England, chances are he may have it. And as a thank you to supporting him for supporting our show, we've got a discount promo code for you. If you would like to get free shipping, use the promo code Josh, J-O-S-H. Or if you want to get 10% off your order, use promo code Josh10. And that will get you... 10% off your order. And thank you, Anton. And of course, as always, if you'd like to talk to somebody about the baloney nonsense and dysfunction happening all around you, you can book an hour one-on-one -on -one with me. Go to joshuaslocum.net and my calendar and availability is on there. I would love to talk to you. If you have a cluster B type problem in your family or in your work, or if you just want to shoot the shit with somebody who's sane on at least a few topics. I get a lot of that and I enjoy those a lot too. Um, I can also help you with funeral planning. <laughs> it's a multi-purpose tool. Again, visit joshuaslocum.net and if you are a monthly subscriber to Disaffected, you get a nice discount. Come back. When we return from the break, we're going to be talking to therapist Stephanie Wynn. She's been on the show before. She's got a new program for parents who are facing children who are getting into the gender ideology bandwagon called Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria Repair. So come back for that. Disaffected is now streaming on X. Come with us each Sunday and dare to notice reality. You can find us on X at Disaffected Pod. Do you get something from Disaffected you don't find anywhere else? Well, you can help produce the show. Supporting members get access to our private Discord chat server, meetups, and audio episode recording sessions with guests. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. I am really glad to bring back a guest that we've had on the show before. She is therapist Stephanie Wynn, who has been very involved in what has come to be known as rapid onset gender dysphoria. Welcome back, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. Great to be here. Um, and there's a reason we have you here today, because you have a new system. You, I know that you've been working on this for quite a long time. Um, because you have, you have encountered a lot of people um, uh, providing your service who have been caught up in gender ideology. You've talked to kids, you've talked to teens, you've talked to parents, you've seen it from the inside. You're also a working therapist who knows that, sadly, um, the majority of, of the mental health field um, is following very unhelpful guidance when it comes to this. So you've got something, a new program called ROGD repair or rapid onset gender dysphoria repair. Tell us about this. Well, I was a therapist for about eight years before I, <clears throat> excuse me, entered the world of podcasting and being part of the public dialogue about societal issues. And then I continued doing therapy alongside podcasting and networking and really developed this specialization around helping the parents. And then I shifted to a consulting model because what I realized was that the parents didn't need therapy. They didn't need that particular type of relationship and container and intention. They needed to understand what was going on with the psychology of their children. And I was unable to 
work with youth with rapid onset gender dysphoria as soon as I entered the public arena. Because unfortunately, these teens and young adults are consuming so much propaganda and they're so indoctrinated into this belief system that they believe that people like me who would want to protect them from lifelong medical harm are actually the ones doing the harm. So as soon as I had any public presence speaking out on this issue, I pretty much gave up my ability to work with these youth directly, which which wasn't, I had a lot of feelings about that. But the parents kept reaching out to me and I was hearing from parents all over the country as they're working with this consulting model thinking, let me just share what I know from my time working with these youth and from my studying of these issues and just putting two and two together and see what I can do to help these families understand where their kids' heads are at what's affecting them, why the parents aren't able to get through to them. And I I basically got really good at that process with the parents. And a health crisis about six months ago sort of forced me to narrow down what I was doing. And I decided to stop doing therapy altogether, just focus on that parent consulting. And as my energy started to return, I thought, let me put all the tools I've learned actually help these families into one place. And that's how ROGD Repair evolved. It was really from, you know, intensive work, just talking to hundreds of families, troubleshooting what was going wrong in their attempts to reach their indoctrinated kids, and then highlighting, okay, so what are the psychology concepts that these parents need to understand that, you know, I don't blame them for not understanding it. It's just like, oh, this is where you're going wrong, right? Because you're, you're not maybe taking into account sort of the headstrong nature and the fragile ego of a person this age. Also, the cluster B component, which you talk about on this show, is this huge, under-discussed element of what's going on. So as I started really kind of narrowly focusing on this issue, I developed this model I call the trifecta of social contagion. Um, And it's my belief that we can't really help families help their kids I mean, obviously, as I said earlier, it's really hard for professionals to help these kids. And yeah. and so who's who's in the best position to help them? It's the families. But we can't really help families help their kids if we don't take into account the things that are working along with gender identity ideology, which is cluster B personality traits and woke beliefs about social justice. So I have this sort of trifecta model that says, hey, it's actually not one thing. It's these three things working together, creating this perfect storm. And let's help you as a parent understand how that perfect storm works, exactly what psychological vulnerabilities it's preying on in your kid, and then how your approach can take those same vulnerabilities into account. That's okay. You kind of anticipated me uh, very well um, in talking about what you were seeing. I was going to ask you, what were you seeing in these families and among these parents? What were the missing pieces? What did they not get? What was not being offered to them? Um, But tell us, okay, so you have a trifecta model. So if people imagine a triangle, what are the three points of that triangle? So we have gender identity ideology, right? So this is the belief that it's possible to be in the wrong body or to, you know, have a male body, but a female mind or spirit or the idea that you can identify as to whatever you say you are and that people need to respect your pronouns and that it's, you know, that our bodies are these meat Legos that you can cut and paste (laughs) that, you know, that belief system, gender identity ideology um, is one, right? Then we have woke beliefs about social justice And then the third point is cluster B personality traits. So when I talk about cluster B, I'm not saying that every single parent who signs up for my course, their kid has a cluster B personality disorder. Like I'm not here to diagnose anyone. I'm just hearing what people are telling me about traits and behaviors. And, you know, unfortunately, Josh, the thing is that cluster B personality traits and behaviors are, you know kind of a normal part of adolescent development. Yes. And (laughs) like what 17 year old doesn't think they're the center of the universe or, you know, have big mood swings and black and white thinking like that is all so normal. The problem is the way that the culture is encouraging it because what could be kind of a stage that they grow out of, especially when you utter the magic word trans or gender, you know, the moment that comes in the picture, 
and you're not allowed to question that person. Now, that young person who could have just been going through a phase of having a rather obnoxious personality like everyone else their age, now they're on a path to actually, you know, become that type of person in the long run. That's that's one of the most disturbing parts of this to me. You know, we've talked before um viewers or the listeners of the show know that I think this, but, you know, to a close approximation in a sort of lighthearted way, most teenagers are borderlines, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you're emotionally unstable. You're hormonal. Um, it's it's both sexes, um, a little bit more in girls, I'd say, um, in, cer- in certain ways, but boys have their way too. They're confused they're trying to figure out their ego. They're trying to figure out the limits of where their ego goes, right? Like how much, how far can I go with this? When am I going too far? Um, they don't have context for that. And the tragedy is another way of describing somebody who grows up and, and becomes fully cluster B personality disordered is that they are in a stage of arrested development. They're stuck in either or adolescence slash toddler reactions to things. So as you said, we want to, this is what child rearing is about. You you raise them up out of that state. That's part of, of adulthood. But as you say, culturally, legally, medically, mental health wise, we are looking at what are actually DSM obvious cluster B traits and saying, this is a good thing. And not only is it a good thing, this is the real you. That's the way it looks to me. Yeah, and it's scary that young people are being encouraged to build a sense of identity on shifting sands, as it were. Yeah. So, when so you've talked to you've talked to so many people. Well, let me ask it this way: um, how how do I describe it? Is I, mean, I think of ROGD repair as a program or a course program. What what? How do you describe it? Yeah, so it's a course and community for parents. It's entirely online. It's a subscription-based membership. And so when you join, you get access to a constantly growing course side of things in the community. So the course part right now has give or take about 100 lessons. Okay. Um, And I'm always adding more. I have a list of at least 50 or 60 more topics I want to cover. And they're organized into modules. And okay. each of those lessons is a video, an essay, and some questions for reflection. So reflection questions, the, the best way to do the program is if a parent is in a supportive marriage to go through it with their spouse, um, because that's the other person who's there to support you, who has similar observations about your child. And I think going through the program together, asking each other those questions is how parents are really going to make the most of these tools and concepts and apply them to their own family situation. But you can also journal into the program. So there's, um, you know, those open-ended questions have spaces that you can answer. And then you can also find a partner to go through the, you know, if you're like a single parent, you can find a buddy to go through the program with. And then each lesson also has a discussion section. So you have your sort of private journal space that you can type whatever you want into. Then you can also share whatever you want to share with other parents. So that's the course side of things. Okay. And then the community is forums separate from the discussion section on each individual lesson where parents can go. And right now the forums are, you know, it's pretty new. It's only been launched for a few weeks before that we had our beta testers. So the forums are things like, you know, my new lesson alerts and places for people to report bugs and glitches. But I think as it grows, those forums will be places for people to dialogue about gender specific issues, age specific issues, diagnosis specific issues, and things like that. And so um, it is a membership because it's sort of like stay as long as you need, go through the program in whatever order. I definitely recommend going through it sequentially if you can. Mm -hmm. But that said, I understand people are going to be drawn in. They're going to see there's so much content and then they're going to see the titles of certain lessons and they're going to want to skip ahead because those titles resonate for them. Um, And then I'm always going to keep adding more content, also being kind of responsive to who joins the program and what they want to hear about. Um, It's... it's interesting. So I'm particularly curious. You've spoken to so many sets of parents um, who have a child who's in this at some stage. And I am going to ask you to generalize a little bit. I recognize there's a lot of variation here. But if you had to boil down the typical parent or, or, or present a vignette, uh, a composite of the typical parental concerns, 
what do you th- what do you think the typical parent or most parents are missing? What is it that they have not had access to? What is it they don't know before they come in here? And what are they? Let's let me just ask one question at a time. What are the major things that parents don't know that you believe they need to know and that they're going to learn from this? Okay, I got a few of those. So one is that more information does not always help. So one place that parents often go wrong is they try to present their kid with information like, you know, statistics, journal articles, detransitioner videos, things like that. And it almost always backfires. And I I have said to many parents, look, if that worked, I'd be out of a job. Well, I mean, I'd go back to therapy. <laughs> like I just go back to regular therapy because, you know, there there is an abundance of information that these medical interventions, to put it lightly, um, don't do what they promise to do. And, and that, in fact, they do a lot of harm. There is an abundance of information. So if information were enough to convince, if humans were rational actors, as I think, you know, everyone from psychologists, to economics discovered a long time ago, um, we're not right. If humans mm-hmm. were rational a- actors, then we would respond to that. But, you know, you're looking at some of the least rational actors. You're looking at impulsive, headstrong adolescents and young adults with fragile egos. Yeah. So one thing is that more information doesn't always help. Sometimes it hurts. Um, another thing is they forget to take into account that your, your young person has a sense of moral and intellectual superiority. Whether or not they would consciously articulate that, they think they're smarter than you, they think they're smarter than most people, and they think they're more morally righteous than you and most people. And so if you approach them with something that would have them believe that they have been fooled or duped or believed something stupid, their walls are going to go up. Right. So it's, this is where the psychology piece comes in. So more information isn't always helpful. You have to take into account that your young person has these walls up. Um, also mention of detransitioners. Sadly, uh, now that's being branded a right wing dog whistle. So, you know, this is another one of those things, right? Parents try to say detransitioners and regret and stuff like that. And what it does, again, it triggers that button because what the parents are hoping the kids will do is have a humble and sympathetic reaction of, oh, wow, those poor people, that could happen to me. I'm human and fallible too. Maybe I should give this some pause. No, what happens is, oh, too bad that happened to them because they were stupid and they mistook themselves for being trans. But you think I don't know who I am? You think I am capable of making a mistake? Well, F you. There's um, going to be no don't... empathetic identification with with somebody they look at as a failure. You yeah, know. exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of parents expect things to make sense that don't make sense. Like, <laughs> you know, for example, like, um, I'm not female. I'm just a girl. Okay. Or. <laughs> okay. I, I right now in the moment, I'm having a hard time parsing that. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of nonsensical statements that it's like, well, if you haven't, you know, been following down, them down there like anime porn rabbit holes, then of course you don't understand where they're coming from. <laughs> um, True enough. <laughs> another another is that you can trust therapists. I've I've had to walk so many people through this where I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, so tell me again the rationale or the the criteria you looked at for what made you determine that this therapist, pediatrician or psychiatrist was a good match for your child. And I I hear like them just piecing together wishful thinking. Um, And it's like, well, okay, too bad. You just made the situation worse because now your kid has this other adult authority figure backing them up. And I mean, I, I know all the worst case scenarios of times that a kid had, you know, for example, to the suicide thing, right? The, the passive suicidal ideation, they were not really a threat to themselves. They get taken to the hospital. Then they learn all the staff will affirm them, back their parents into a corner, make the whole hospital visit about, you must affirm. And now this youth just became more ingrained into a cluster B behavior pattern because they learned threatening suicide is a power move I can use at any time to get other people to back me up and triangulate and drive a wedge between me and my parents so that my temporary outsized ego, my fragile identity that I have at the age of 16 is now the thing running the show. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ways parents get it wrong. I would say another one is like 
a common mistake is that a lot of these youth are very bright. Um, you know, a lot of them are on the autism spectrum, sort of Asperger's type profile, or they have ADHD, and they they have what I call a lopsided brain. You know, the idea of the twice exceptional, right? So they have maybe a really high IQ, but they can't tie their shoelaces. You know, right. they like right. get frustrated over really simple tasks. Yeah, and parents get kind of lured in to seeing how bright their kid is, and they they forget to see how fragile they are or how naive they are in some ways and to take into account their actual kind of emotional developmental level. Yeah. And then one more mistake, and I could go on, but one more mistake I'll say for now on the list of things that parents do is they try to chip away at the youth's coping mechanism without supplanting a better coping mechanism. So Ooh. you have to realize the the um, the role that the fantasy of being trans plays for the kid. When I hear the things that the parents report their kids are saying, some of them are in a really, really dark place and they've pinned all of their hopes of life being better and life being different on this idea of when I'm trans, when I pass. And it's, yeah. it's really very fantastical. But if all you're doing is trying to burst that bubble by saying, no, your life won't be better, it'll be worse. Here's all the statistics, you know, whether, whether you're doing it with facts and statistics or emotional arguments, doesn't matter, but you're not recognizing the psychological vulnerability and why they're drawn to put up that, to, to that, that shell or that alter ego, then, you know, it's sort of like, um, trying to take away cigarettes from ex junkies on a psych ward. It's like, that is yep. their last crutch. You know, <laughs> like, good analogy. Got to come at it a different way. Good analogy. Well, let's let's talk about let's talk about what exactly are the cluster B concepts, the personality traits that that parents really need to understand and know about. And of course, most people who listen to this show are familiar with this. But just to orient anyone who may be um, new to this, cluster B personality disorders are called the dramatic and erratic personality disorders. They're a distortion of the way people think and feel and relate to other people. And they include, I can only generalize here, but it, they're behaviors that have a high degree of narcissism, a high degree of emotional instability, very back and forth between elation and despair. Uh, people looking at other people. Um, one day, um, your best friend is the most beautiful, fabulous, loving person in the world. And the next day when she disappoints you, she is the worst evil bitch ever. It's very black and white thinking. Um, so it's distorted emotions about your ego. And it, and it can lead people into uh, making extremely self-destructive choices. Um, so what are what are the cluster B, I don't know, greatest hits, if you will, that you think most parents really need to get under their belt to, to have a good grounding in what they're dealing with in this whole world one, of things? One trait I see a lot of in the behaviors and language that parents report, and honestly what their kids post on social media too, is grandiosity. Um, so for example, and, and looking at that trifecta again, it's, it's the gender identity ideology with the woke beliefs. So mm -hmm. let's say, um, you know, right now this idea of queers for Palestine is having its heyday. Um, and so let's say there, there's a kid who sort of identifies with that movement. They might say things like, you know, basically along the lines of my mere existence as a, you know, queer person of color, however they're defining that, you know, it's yeah. this identity politics, my mere existence is an act of resistance, right? Like, yeah. there's a lot of grandiosity. <laughs> yeah. Have you, you, yes. You're, you know, you know what this brings to mind? You, I'm sure you've seen this, Stephanie. Um, somebody will post, trans people are sacred. Right. They're sacred. Right. Yeah. And it's it's literal hagiography. I mean, they actually make images that evoke um, the connotations of the Virgin Mary and the and the halo behind <laughs> them. It's quite literal. Right. They're they're literally making saints of, uh, you know, whoever the subject is there. OK, that's a good one. Got any more? Yeah, so there's this sort of grandiose false self persona that they use as as a crutch for their their frailty and their lack yeah. of a stable identity. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the emotional instability. And by the way, um, I will add one of the lessons in the course is 
for predicting how your daughter will behave depending on where she's at in her menstrual cycle. Okay. Um, because I think that, you know, for girls who have big mood swings or borderline traits, that a lot of that is the first few years of the hormonal roller coaster and that yeah. girls aren't provided good enough education about really how to take care of themselves and manage themselves at different stages of how um, estrogen and progesterone are fluctuating. So I actually have a lesson on this, like, like, you know, time it during the follicular phase if you can, but here's what to do during her luteal phase to improve your relationship with her. Yep. So, you know, the, the emotional instability, of course, like you said, the idealization and devaluation and the splitting. So there's kind of this romanticizing of the so-called rainbow family. And a lot of the relationships there are actually quite fragile um, and and not very substantial, but the treatment of the parents is very much, um, you know, sort of villainizing them. There's a lot of splitting and projection. And one of the tricks, uh, tricks, one of the, you know, techniques that I teach in my course is for parents to recognize hidden sound, hidden signs of doubt and ambivalence. Because if you've studied cluster B dynamics, then you know that at the heart of a lot of cluster B behaviors is the psychological defense called splitting, um, where, you know, we split ourselves into parts, we project parts of ourselves on other people. And that's part of the borderline behavior is I love you one moment, I hate you the next, I don't have an integration between those split off parts of me that have mixed feelings towards you. So, this is one thing youth do a lot is split and project. And then the parents end up feeling guilty, you know, the fog of uh, fear, obligation and guilt, emotional blackmail. Yeah. I believe that term was coined in that book. Um, you know, so what I do is I teach parents to recognize how the emotions they're having, like guilt, anxiety and confusion are often actually indicators that their kid has split off and projected a part of them onto the parents. So for uh. example, the doubt, right? Because normal, like healthy, mature, integrated people who are considering any major life decision tend to have doubts about it. Um, you know, moving to a different city, changing career paths, who you're going to yeah. marry. These are things that people need to process doubts about. So when we look at these young people uh, who are expressing all this certainty on the surface about who they are and what they want to do with their bodies and all this kind of stuff. I don't believe it for one second. I think there's repressed and split off doubt under the surface yes. and where parents kind of get themselves into trouble is when they get into these sort of headbutting clashes where they fully embody that, you know, being the source of all the doubt. And then the kid doubles down on being the source of all the certainty. Uh -huh. So my tools are about learning to recognize when you're being projected onto and, how to hold up a mirror to your kid's own doubt or how to befriend or usher in their doubt so that they can actually come to terms with the um, cognitive dissonance within them. That by itself, that, that specific lesson, that specific topic is, that's of such practical utility to so many people well outside of, of this specific topic area. Uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria. I mean, that alone is is in, is, I think, under discussed. Um, I certainly haven't heard it put to me uh, that way, but it makes it it makes perfect sense. You know, what do you do when you are being projected on? Um, is this a situation where the problem that is stopping the communication is you both don't understand what's going on here with this splitting and and this denial that there is doubt and how to get around that? That sounds incredibly useful. Um, let's um, we got just a couple more minutes here. I I, I think I want to ask. I want to ask a hard thing. It's probably not fair because we probably should have had an hour and a half for this. But I, I would like to know, what do you think, what happens with the families who want to make use of your program, but the parents themselves may be mired in this distorted uh, relational thinking, whether it's full cluster B or traits of or, or any of that? What, what happens when, because it's often the case, the problems the child is having are a reflection of the problems that parents have had in the home. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was talking to a friend uh, who does good work in the gender critical community um, who looked at my course and she said her only complaint is like she only glanced at it briefly, but she saw something that 
because she was raised by a narcissistic mother, she has this filter where anything she sees, she sort of interprets how would someone like my mother see this as an opportunity to point the finger at someone else and excuse themselves from all the blame. So, so my friend basically saw the section on cluster B and, you know, mention of antisocial traits and was like, you know, seeing through that filter of the parent who's just looking for someone to tell them it's not your fault. And, you know, I feel like the vast majority of the people who have come to me for help and, and partly my perspective is skewed because I charge for my time and that inherently weeds out people who were ambivalent or acting in bad faith. You know, it's people who uh, really are invested, I think, yeah. um, that I've mostly been working with and like very good people. And they, they want to hear anything I think they could be doing differently. Okay. Um, but yeah. I've seen quite a large split though, between the types of people who come to me for help earnestly, sincerely that, you know, they want to know anything they they can do differently. And we have great rapport and I do tell them what they can do differently and they don't take that as an attack on their character. But I see a split between sort of that side of the RGD parent community, so to speak. Um, yeah. And some of the online activism around RGD parents where like I've been castigated um, by people who, you know, took one thing I said in the most negative way possible and, you know, and it's like, well, is, is that how you always act? Because that could be contributing to the problem. So I, um, you know, when it comes to people doing my course again, I think like the fact that my course requires a commitment up front, it's not just the money, it's your time, it's your investment. The fact that there's so much about what, I mean, the whole course is basically what you can do differently, right? Because it's, yeah. I work with a lot of parents with really limited leverage. Um, a lot of parents whose kids are over 18. Um, and that's where my program is different from some of the programs designed for parents who have more authority and leverage. Um, yeah, I think on some, on some level that the very nature of the program will weed out people who are just looking for someone to tell them Makes it's sense. not your fault. There's nothing you can do. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's let's let people know where they can get this, uh, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, and I'll make sure to put this uh, linked in the show notes as well. Um, people who are interested in your work and want to take a look at your program, where do they go? Where's the best place to go? It's at ROGDrepair.com. Well, that couldn't be easier. Let me repeat that. R O G D repair.com. That's fantastic. Stephanie, we got to close up here, but uh, thank you very much. I'm really delighted. I knew that something was coming down the pike, um, and I have been looking forward to hearing about it. And I'm really glad to, uh, to talk about it with you. Thanks for sharing it with our audience. Hopefully this is gonna get, I know this is gonna get out in front of some people who could actually use it because I know that some people in the audience um, who've come to me for coaching and consulting um, have absolutely wanted something like this. I'm so glad it's out there. Well, thanks so much for having me, Josh. Disaffected is now streaming on X. Come with us each Sunday and dare to notice reality. You can find us on X at Disaffected Pod. Do you get something from Disaffected you don't find anywhere else? Well, you can help produce the show. Supporting members get access to our private Discord chat server, meetups, and audio episode recording sessions with guests. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Welcome back. Don't forget that we are now streaming on X slash Twitter every Sunday night. That's when our show comes out. You can watch us streaming on X. You can watch us streaming on Rumble, or you can catch us on YouTube. 9 p.m. United States Eastern Time every Sunday. Let's talk about third world America. People are finally beginning to, to notice unauthorized, of course, this is unauthorized noticing, 
But they are beginning to notice that the country is being overrun in many areas by third world criminals who get away with being criminals because they have brown skin and the Democrats want their illegal votes. That's it. That's all there is to it. Yes, it is because they have brown skin. And yes, it is because the Democrats want their illegal votes. Yes. I'm all the way done now. All the way done. Not holding back on any of this anymore. I don't want illegal foreigners in my country. Auslander Rouse. I am going to point out that they are being favored because they have brown skin. I am going to point out that our own country is racist, but the racism is directed at white people. No more fucking around with this. These people also get away with what they get away with because Democrats like, some of them do, they like seeing white girls and white women raped and killed by brown men because it does things for them politically. <laughs> They like seeing white people suffer. Yeah, I'm including white politicians, too, on the left. You think that's extreme? Then you figure out what their motivation is. And if you decide that it's out of the goodness of their hearts, <laughs> you and I have nothing to talk about. We're in different worlds. Well, they're getting what they want. Let's visit San Diego. Saw this story the other day. Migrants in San Diego attempted to hijack two school buses filled with children. That's right, San Diego, California. Let's listen to about 40 seconds of a news report on this. A group of migrants tried to board a school bus this morning while it was traveling to a school. The superintendent for the Hamul del Zora Union School District informed parents of that incident earlier today. It happened at one of the stops on the school district's bus route that heads to Oak Grove Middle School and Hamul Primary. Meanwhile, yesterday afternoon in a similar area along another route, the superintendent says that a group of migrants tried to stop another bus. Border Patrol, CHP and the sheriff's office have now been informed of these incidents. The superintendent says that for the safety of everyone, if a driver sees a group of migrants at a bus stop, they will drive past it on uh, and move on to the next. Listen to the language. Did you hear it? A group of migrants tried to board a school bus. It's just migrants just trying to board the bus. Migrants. Do you get it yet? What they're doing? How they're programming you? Migrants. You know, like migrant farm workers. You know, it's Jorge, the guy who picks your strawberries. You like Jorge and his family, don't you? Don't you? There's more in Colorado. This story, armed gangs have taken over a migrant-filled apartment complex in Aurora, Colorado. This is Biden's America, and it'll be 100 times worse under Kamala. That's true. Aurora, Colorado is a suburb of Denver. Um, let's, uh, we've got some video for this. Let's roll it. He's got a rifle with a scope right there. This is an apartment complex in Aurora, Colorado. I've been through Aurora, Colorado. I have friends who live in Denver. I've been through this neighborhood many, many times. We're supposed to be the first world. Did you see that? Did you see this group of Spanish-speaking migrants, all men in their early 20s, carrying rifles with scopes, going up and... This is, this is America. This isn't fucking El Salvador. Because we've got all of their criminals now in Venezuela, too. People in this complex, I've, I've seen them. I saw them on news broadcasts. I didn't clip everything for you on the show. You can look it up. People in this complex are showing how the, they are installing additional locks on their doors and bracing the door handle, the doorknob, with a cane or a bar at night to stop people getting in. They say, the, the residents, they say that the cops won't do anything, that the city officials won't do anything. Nobody will respond. 
Here's more also from Aurora, Colorado. This is from the parking lot of, um, of a Target at which three to 5,000 Venezuelan migrants decided to congregate, trash the parking lot, and shoot guns into the air. Look. Nigga, the Venezuelans is taking over. They just jacked them? Oh, me. These niggas is out here tripping. Look at the, look at the filth on the ground. Look at this. Bro, damn, they done made a mess of shit. I think this guy almost gets hit, too, by somebody in, in a second, if I remember right. Nigga, y'all are on bullshit out here. They is on bullshit. Oh, shit. What the f- Yeah, they're tripping. Nigga, they are Nigga, they cracking off in the air and everything. They driving over the... Nigga, we almost just got hit. Yep. <laughs> Do you remember when President Trump got all of that heat for talking about people who are coming in from shit hole countries? I will admit, because I still had a touch of Trump derangement syndrome, that I found the imperfect. When I hear it the first time, it's inappropriate. Ugh. I hate old me. They are shithole countries. They're pieces of shit countries. Haiti is a shithole country. Venezuela is a shithole country. Not good countries. They don't produce the kinds of people that we want here, at least not the ones who are showing up. I don't like the third world. The third world is not my responsibility, and I will not have the third world in my first world country. I don't have to. So he was right. Again. Now, would you like to know what the Aurora, Colorado Police Department has to say about this? You know what's coming, but I think even you are going to be surprised, you jaded disaffectants. <laughs> I'm going to read to you a press release from the Aurora, Colorado Police Department. Misinformation has spread on social media regarding the large gathering on Sunday at Gardens on Havana Shopping Center. We recognize that Sunday's incident was disconcerting and alarming for a large number of our residents and citizens. And then they put in hashtag fact check. The purpose of this message is to provide the community with accurate information based on what we know right now. An estimated three to 4,000 people gathered Sunday at the Gardens on Havana Shopping Center to await the Venezuelan presidential election results. <laughs> oh, my God. The Aurora Police Department learned about the gathering before 5 p.m. when there was a report of suspicious activity at the shopping center. Uh, the PD subsequently investigated a report of an assault on a store employee during a shoplifting incident. The PD established a command post to monitor the gathering. There were incidents of shots being fired into the air during the gathering. APD did not receive any reports of anyone being injured by the gunfire. Keeps going. The large crowd made it difficult for customers to enter and leave the shopping center, and roadways in the immediate area were impassable. Trash and debris were left behind by those who attended the event. The PD did not make any arrests, nor did officers issue any tickets, citations, or summons. There is no evidence to date that the gathering was organized by a criminal organization or that any gang activity occurred related to the gathering. While there are claims that some attendees at the gathering rioted, causing damage to businesses, passing vehicles, and causing harm to passersby in the area, the Aurora PD has received no such reports to date. An Aurora patrol unit was hit by an unknown object while driving in the area, and it is unclear at this time if it was related to the gathering. The object caused minor damage, and APD is still investigating the incident. I'm sorry, I can't not read it this way. I can't not do this because it's, it's so absurd. 
they're 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 correcting misinformation by telling you that all of <laughs> that all the things that didn't happen happened but didn't happen. I don't I, I Kevin, I wish you were on here with me right now. I don't even know how to explain what's wrong with this. I've never seen anything like this. No, it didn't happen. Yes, it happened. No, it didn't happen. Yes, it happened. No, it didn't. <laughs> well, we know it's not happening um, for other reasons. And, and, and how do we know that? Well, um, because Democrat senators tell us. Um, here is Connecticut Senator Democrat Chris Murphy. Oh, it's a really good question, right? You, you, you do have to acknowledge people's fear today. I mean, there are many neighborhoods in this country that have unacceptable levels of violence. That is just true. Um, but you don't have to feed in to the irrational fear that Trump is trying to make people feel. And, and it is important to push back on this idea of a migrant crime wave. We don't have to accept that as the dominant narrative. Why? Because the data actually tells us that immigrants to this country commit crimes at a rate lower than natural born <laughs> Americans. Now, that is an inconvenient narrative for Fox News and for the Trump campaign, but it is true. So I think we have a moral obligation as well as a political obligation um, to push back against this idea that you are at risk if you live in a community with more migrants. And then we also just have to tell people that crime went up when Donald Trump was president. He did nothing to stop it. Crime is going down under Joe Biden, and he did something to stop it. He passed the most significant anti-gun violence bill in a generation. So again, we have these, these true narratives available to us, and your question is a good one. Um, will they work politically? I guess I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that um, if we say it enough, we have a chance to convince people of true things. If we say it enough, we have a chance to convince people of true things. That's capital T true, like mini true. Capital T true, T-R-U, it's a brand name. It means a lie. We just repeat the lie enough. Trump is trying to make people feel irrational fear. They can't think on their own. Uh, they wouldn't have any fear on their own if it weren't Trump doing it to them. I guess he's literally whispering in every single person's ear. Um, People are not noticing that there are a lot of people here illegally who are allowed to rob, rape, and murder them. And anyway, even if they did, to fear that is irrational, and they wouldn't have that irrational fear if it weren't for Donald Trump, that son of a bitch. What Chris Murphy means, really, is that white Americans are scumbags, and they're more criminal anyway. These Americans were worse. Do you believe that claim at face value, that the crime rate per capita for an American citizen is much higher than for migrants? Do you believe that claim? And if you do, ask yourself why you believe it. What prior assumptions are you working on that makes that sound plausible to you? Because it isn't plausible. It does not pass the smell test. Migrants commit less crime per capita. Oh, God. All right. I got a couple of things I want to hit on to close up the show here. One of them is how comfortable we are getting giving up our constitutional rights. We're being prepared for this, and uh, we're doing a wonderful job. Lots of, lots of us have gotten used to algorithms and artificial intelligence programs, quote, making mistakes. So I'll give you some examples of these. Um, and here, making mistakes in inverted commas. People are now treating these, the following things as normal. A, you, uh, YouTube, for example, an algorithm or an AI immediately blocking your video and demonetizing your channel or doing something similar. Immediate, automatic, no human intervention. Or a uh, social media platform like Twitter slash X, suspending your account immediately. And it, I mean, it's happened to me so many times, it's, it's instantaneous. You can, see, you can see the screen flash. When you're, when you're on Twitter and you see the screen sort of go white and flash, you know that that means an AI found you and you're about to get a new message about how you're a bad person. Because an AI found a word or a string of words that is on the naughty words list and it does not understand context. I am terrified of how used to this people have become. It scares me to see people say things like this, as they do often. Oh, I'm sure it's a mistake, and you can just ask the nice people for a manual review. 
That's probably the most common response I've seen when I've complained about this. This is not going to end with annoying software products or tech devices. It's already metastasizing into the way our government treats us, and we are, con we are treating that as normal. We're accepting it. Here are just a couple of the things that I believe we can look forward to in the very near future. I mean, within a year. There are countless others I can think of. Here are just a couple. Number one, automatic AI or algorithm suspension of your driver's license. It's going to happen instantaneously. You'll get to ask the nice people for a manual review, but only after your rights have been taken away summarily by a machine with no human consideration. So you pass a camera and it believes you're doing X miles over the speed limit, or you pass a camera and it, it, it optically reads uh, the sticker, like in Vermont, there's a little sticker you have to stick on your back uh, plate that says you've been inspected. Um, it gets it wrong or it gets it right, but it just immediate. You get an immediate app notification that your driver's license has been suspended and will not be unsuspended until you go through some rigmarole. That's going to happen. Um, having your voter registration canceled, that's going to happen too. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to ask the nice people for a manual review, but only after the election, only after you have not been allowed to cast your ballot. All of this and much, much more is just around the corner in the future. And you know what this is? It's the destruction of your constitutional right to due process, literally. Agencies, I mean, they may as well just get rid of habeas corpus, produce the body the right to face your accusers. Due process means your rights don't get taken away until you have had the opportunity to defend yourself in a fair court setting. That's what due process means. The high level concept, the constitutional concept of the right to due process does in fact devolve onto other government agencies. They also have an affirmative obligation to give you due process. But that is at risk of becoming inoperative in actual practice. In many cases, it is now inoperative. Uh, the Constitution is moot. And, and it's not, the root of this, the problem here is not the technology itself. There's lots of problems with the technology, but this problem exists, whether it's AI we're talking about or a mechanical clockwork that did the same thing. It's at risk because of what we, you and I, Americans, have already accepted as normal. That we don't have these rights and that we can just rely on the nice people for a manual review and that's just normal and it's just what we have to put up with. It is us, the citizens, doing this to ourselves. We are accelerating this by cooperating with it. I'm going to switch gears here. Um, can you put that picture up, Kevin? Yeah. This famous one, you've all seen it. It's a still frame from The Simpt Simpsons. It's got Grandpa Simpson in a newspaper literally shaking his fist in a picture at a cloud, and it says, Old Man Yells at Cloud. All right. So we've done a cultural 180 on how we see young people and old people and their relationship with each other. And that 180 started or accelerated around the mid 20th century. Um, and it fits very nicely with the woke communist agenda. The creation of the teenager as a wholly separate, unique stage of life, the way we see it and treat it today is in fact a creation. It is not a natural feature of humans and all human societies. Yes, wait, wait before you object. Yes, those who are between ages about 12 and 18 do have certain typical characteristics of that stage of life. They are moody, they are hormonal, they are impulsive, they're horny all the time. Those things that mark the teenage years are all real. I'm not denying that they're real. They are. What I'm saying is that the inflated idea of the teenager as an all-encompassing capital I identity, its own demographic group, almost its own subspecies, that is new. It did start in the mid-20th century, and it's not good. We have stoked, encouraged, and inflamed these teenage traits and behaviors over time instead of moderating them as we used to do when we understood that our responsibility as parents and as adult members of the community was to mold children, not to be steamrollered by them. 
it coincides with our cultural worship of youth, which is actually our fear of death. We've elevated the young and degraded the old. That's why we have cultural jokes like old man shouts at clouds. Stop and think about that for a minute. That joke wouldn't exist in a culture that valued the wisdom of elders. I know you think this is normal. It's not normal. It's America normal, but it's sure as shit not normal. And it isn't even really funny. I'm getting real tired of it. You know, that's why the first comment that comes to our mind when a grumpy old man like me complains about vexing or stupid, useless anti-user technology or user interfaces, the very first and most common response that comes to most people, whether they mean it um, as an insult or whether they're, they're trying to jokingly agree, the first thing is grumpy old man. <laughs> grumpy old man. Notice that. It's the very first joke that you want to make, most of you, and it's the thing that you expect to hear as a reaction from other people if you ever say anything like the kinds of things I talk about. Um, it's, it's useful to, uh, well, it's a reversal. Again, it's a reversal of the normal order. Um, we have devalued wisdom, discernment, autonomy, hierarchy, and merit and excellence. Now step back and just look at it from a distance. Here's some of the things that we believe that are actually anti-sane. One, people get dumber as they age. Two, people's opinions become less topical and relevant as they age. Number three, the aging process makes you stupider, less important, and less useful to society. Now, you may say to yourself, well, I personally don't believe any of those things. So what? I've got two answers to that. Maybe you don't, but society at large does. And actually, I think most of us have accepted these ideas. I, I, think, I think you might actually believe them, at least to some degree. A lot of us don't think that we believe these things, but our actions show that we do. It's not hard. I mean, it, it, it is hard not to believe them because this is universally culturally enforced. Older people have bought into this. They are embarrassed and apologetic about being older. You know, just as society wants them to be. Think about how many times that you've been, if you're middle-aged or, or elderly, think about how many times you've been tempted if you needed help for something, to preface your request for help with something like, I know this makes me sound older like a boomer, but, right? That, that's it. Would a culture that respected the benefits of age and experience prompt us to pre-defend ourselves this way by degrading our own dignity? By apologizing for being a stupid old person who doesn't understand something they've never seen before? No just on account of the fact that we've lived longer than the young means that we need to be embarrassed and apologetic. <laughs> no. When experienced, seasoned people who have learned a lot in a long life willingly degrade their own value to go along with this, I don't see how we get out of it. 